Welcome back. This is part two of unit five, and we are continuing our discussion of one of my favorite topics, heredity, genetics. When we last spoke, we were discussing the work of Gregor Mendel, and uh, the example that you see here was one of the many monohybrid experiments that Mendel conducted during a, a nine-year period in the 1850s and 1860s. And uh, it's called monohybrid because in this experiment, Mendel is only studying one trait, in this case, flower color. And of course, there were many different traits that Mendel studied, flower color, seed color, the height of the plant, and, and several others. Whenever he did a genetic cross with pea plants that only studied one trait, that was called a monohybrid cross or a monohybrid experiment. But Mendel became curious about another element of heredity. He wondered when a pea plant, when, when pea plant parents pass down their genes for flower color, purple or white alleles, does that have any impact on the height of the plant? Or the genes that are passed down for flower color, does that affect seed color or seed shape? In other words, he wondered, are all physical traits inherited independently or are they passed down in batches? Are they passed down, are, are certain genes always passed down to the next generation along with other specific genes? Um, and the only way to figure that out was through a slightly more complex uh, format of genetic cross, which is called the dye hybrid cross. And that's what we're going to discuss today in part two. We're going to talk about Mendel's dye hybrid cross experiments. Dye meaning two. So this is going to be a genetic cross still with pea plants, but um, where we study two traits at a time. And then we're also going to talk about the conclusions that Mendel published in 1865. Remember, he wrote up his findings with all of his elegant mathematical calculations, statistical analysis to back up all of his conclusions. And he published this in 1865. He even presented his findings to a group of scientists and they didn't get it. It was too far ahead of its time. And so Mendel's results, his conclusions were ignored for 35 years. It wasn't until 1900, which unfortunately was 16 years after his death, that his contributions were finally appreciated and finally understood by the scientific community. So we're going to talk about what exactly were those conclusions. When he, when he wrote his research paper in 1865, what did he say? What had he learned about heredity by studying those pea plants um, and, and it's, it's pretty important because this, these findings of Gregor Mendel became the, the foundation that we still use today for genetics. So let's get started. Okay, so first of all, what is a dye hybrid cross and how is this different from the pea plant experiments that we discussed last time? A dye hybrid cross is a genetic cross in which two traits are studied at the same time. So maybe he's looking at flower color and seed color, or maybe he's looking at um, flower color and the height of the plant. You know, so maybe you, maybe he's cross pollinating a tall pea plant with purple flowers crossed with another pea plant that is short and has white flowers. So you get the idea. You're studying two traits at the same time. Um, the data from Mendel's dye hybrid cross experiments formed the basis of one of the most important uh, genetic laws, Mendel's law of independent assortment. So we're going to talk about what that is, what it says, and what it means. 
and we're going to learn how to set up and and how to do a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross. Now you remember monohybrid crosses. Let me go back to the picture. In a monohybrid cross, there's two possible sperm, two possible eggs, and therefore only four possible offspring. But in a dihybrid cross, there's going to be four possible sperm, four possible eggs, and therefore 16 possible offspring. So it's going to be a larger Punnett square. Instead of two by two, it's going to be four by four. And, um, and so it's a little bit more complicated, but, but not, not too bad. Okay, so in one of Mendel's many dihybrid experiments, he cross-pollinated um, a pea plant that had green wrinkled seeds with another plant that had uh, round yellow seeds. So, so notice this is two separate traits. We're dealing with the, the color of the seeds. Some pea plants produce yellow seeds, other pea plants produce dark green seeds, but we're also looking at seed shape. Um, when you see a wrinkled pea like this, that doesn't just mean that it's dried up or it didn't get enough water. Um, it, th this is an actual genetic trait. Some pea plants produce smooth, round pea shape, and other pea plants produce kind of a wrinkly shape. And so this was two separate traits. And so when he cross-pollinated these two plants, um, this plant was true breeding for yellow round seeds crossed with another plant that was true breeding for green wrinkled, um, the, the, all of the offspring turned out with yellow round seeds. And it's pretty easy to understand why that is, because this plant was homozygous yellow, big Y, big Y, and homozygous round, big R, big R. And then the other parent was homozygous uh, green, which is little y, little y, that's a recessive trait, and homozygous wrinkled, little r, little r, uh, which is also green is, um, or excuse me, wrinkled is also a recessive trait. Um, and so this plant can only produce one kind of gamete. Every single gamete is going to get a big R and a big Y. That's the only genes that can be passed down from this parent. And when the other plant makes its gametes, it can only pass down little y, little r, because that's all it has. And so every single time you cross-pollinate these two plants, this plant is always going to pass down a big y. This plant has to pass down a little y, because that's all it has. This plant passes down big r, and this plant passes down little r. So the genotype would be heterozygous yellow, heterozygous round. The phenotype would be yellow round seeds. That's the F1 generation. That's exactly what Mendel got. He got this same result every single time. And he did some of these experiments hundreds of times just to make sure that he was getting consistent results. He got this result every single time. Okay, so one thing that Mendel did not know initially was when you allow this F1 generation, when you allow this heterozygous yellow, heterozygous round plant to self-pollinate, cross with itself, okay, does the big Y allele have to be passed down along with the big R? Or is it possible for this plant to make a gamete that has, say, a big Y and a little r? Um, every time big R gets passed down, does it have to always get passed down with big Y? Or, or could you have a sperm cell or egg cell that has a little Y and a big R? Do the genes for seed color have anything to do with the inheritance of seed shape, or are they passed down independently? 
He did not know. The only way to find out was to look at the F2 data. Okay, so if we hypothesize that uh, the dominant alleles are always passed down together and the recessive alleles must also stay together, that would be called dependent assortment. That would mean that any time this plant makes a sperm cell with a big Y, it also has to pass down a big R. Or if it makes a sperm with a little Y, it has to also pass down a little R. And the eggs would be the same way. And so if that was true, then the F2 generation, the, the, the babies of this plant, would, uh, would look like this. We would expect three-fourths of them to have yellow round seeds and only one-fourth to have green wrinkled. That's called a three-to-one ratio. That kind of looks like just a regular monohybrid cross. Well, the other possibility is called independent assortment, and it says that when this plant makes sperm or eggs, that which one of the two Ys gets passed down, big Y or little Y, has nothing to do with which one of the two Rs gets passed down. In other words, you could have a sperm that gets big Y and big R, but you could also have a sperm that gets big Y and little r. And you could have a sperm that gets little y, big r, or little y, little r, and those are equally probable. And so when this plant self-pollinates, if independent assortment is the correct hypothesis, then there's going to be four possible sperm, four possible eggs, and instead of getting a simple little boring 3 to 1 ratio, you get what's called a 9-3-3-1 ratio. What the heck does that mean? It means that 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 of the offspring would, be, would have yellow round seeds, uh, 9 out of 16, and then 3 out of 16 would have yellow wrinkled seeds, and three, right here, three out of 16 would have um, green round, and only one out of 16 would inherit both of the recessive traits that would be green wrinkled. <laughs> wow, okay, so what did Mendel's data actually show? These are just hypotheses, but Mendel's data and he did this experiment many, 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 many times. Every time he did the experiment, he did, in fact, get a 9-3-3-1 ratio that looked like this. In fact, these numbers that I copied and pasted from the textbook, these are actual numbers from Mendel's actual pea plant experiments uh, in the 1860s. Uh, this was the actual data that he reported in 1865. And you can see... Um, I didn't add these up, but but out of all the baby plants, um, 315 of them grew up to have um, round yellow seeds. 108 grew up to have um, round green. 101 had wrinkled yellow, and only 32 had the two recessive traits of wrinkled seed and green seed. And so if you, if you do the math, that works out to be about 9 sixteenths, just over half, we're, we're like this with both dominant traits. 3 out of 16 looked like this, 3 out of 16 like this, 3 out of 16 looked like this. So it turns out this is the correct way to show what's going on with a dihybrid cross. Let's take a closer look at that dihybrid cross. Okay, so let's take a closer look here. So I'm crossing this plant that is heterozygous for the yellow seed trait and heterozygous for the round shape. I'm crossing this plant with, with itself, essentially, another plant that is heterozygous yellow, heterozygous round. 
And because this is a dihybrid cross, every single sperm and every single egg have to get two genes. One gene for seed color and another gene for seed shape. So to make sure that you're getting all of your combinations of Y's and R's, <laughs> to make sure you're getting those combinations correct, it's helpful to use uh, the FOIL method, similar to the FOIL method that you may have used in certain types of math problems. So let me just focus on one parent at a time. This is the, the male plant, if you will. Okay, so this is going to be the sperm. So this plant has two genes for seed color, two genes for seed shape, and every sperm is going to get one of the two genes for color and one of the two genes for shape. So the, the smart way to do this is the FOIL method. You know it's first, outer, inner, and last, right? You knew that already. So first means we're going to take the first Y, which happens to be a big Y, and the first R, which happens to be a big R, and that would be one possible sperm. And then we go to outer, so the two letters on the outside, which is a big Y and a little R, that's another possible sperm. And then FOIL method, F-O-I, that means I means inner. So we take the two letters on the inside, which is little R, big, uh, excuse me, little Y, <laughs> big R, is another possible sperm. And then L for last. So we're going to take the last Y, which is the, the second one, right? There's only two. And the last R, which is the second R, and that's little, little, little Y, little R. So FOIL method, again, uh, you do first Y, first R, outer, inner, and last. And if you do that, you'll always have your, um, your Punnett square set up correctly. Of course, you're going to have to do the same thing for the eggs. Um, so we would come down here, we take the first Y, then the first R, put it right there, and then outer would be big Y, little r, inner would be these two that goes here, and then the last Y and the last R, last Y and last R right here. All right. So um, you can see this has already been done. Somebody has already filled in all 16 boxes. And, and the way you fill in the boxes is exactly the same way you do for any Punnett square. So you're going to take these two letters and bring them down and take these two letters and bring them across. The only, only thing you want to make sure is that you keep your Ys together and keep your Rs together. Um, so let's say I'm filling in this box way down here. So, so that would be little y, little r comes all the way across, and then um, little y, little r comes down, you see, and so we're going to keep the y's together and the r's together. And so remember, anytime you're looking at a Punnett square, all of the boxes, we have 16 boxes on a dihybrid cross, all of those boxes represent potential offspring. You know, so we got parent number one, and we got parent number two. These are all of the possible eggs. These are all of the possible sperm. So these represent 16 possible offspring. And when we do the phenotype ratio, we're just going to simply write what fraction, what proportion of all the possible offspring are going to have yellow seeds that are round. Okay. And it's 9 out of 16, just like what Mendel got. Now, how do I know that all of these ones that are shaded in are yellow round? Because yellow is dominant, big Y, and round is dominant, big R. So any plant that has even just one big Y is going to have yellow seeds. And if it has even just one big R it's going to have round seeds. Okay? So now we want to know, well, 
how many of the baby plants are going to grow up to have um, yellow wrinkled seeds? And you can see that um, that would be any plant that has a big Y, either two big Ys or just one big Y, and two little R's. Little R, little R makes the plant have wrinkled seeds. Because remember, big R is for round, and that was dominant. So little r is for wrinkled, and that's recessive. Um, green, the only way to have green seeds is little y, little y. And so green round seeds would be any plant that has homozygous little y and at least one big R. And there's three of those. And then the only one we haven't counted is this homozygous green, homozygous wrinkled. There's only one of those. And so this is called a 9, 3, 3, 1 ratio. This was the typical F2. Remember, that's the, the babies of the babies, the F2 generation. This was the typical F2 ratio that Mendel got. And what it proves, if you're confused by the numbers, all this really proves, the reason why this is important, it proves that when a parent, let me go back to my, to my parents here, when a parent produces sperm or when a parent produces eggs, the genes for different traits are passed down independently. So when this plant passes down genes for uh, seed color, that has nothing to do with the genes that are getting passed down for seed shape. So a sperm can have a big Y and a big R, or a big Y and a little R. It could have little Y, big R, or little Y, little R. The genes for different traits, color, and shape are passed down independently. And this became known as the law of independent assortment. Okay, so in 1865, after nine years of pea plant experiments, nine years of counting offspring, nine years of statistical analysis of volumes of data, Gregor Mendel boiled down his findings to four main principles that govern our understanding of genetics. Now it's important to note as we talk about Mendel's conclusions, when we talk about his rules of heredity and laws of heredity, that it's like a lot of rules, there are exceptions. Not every gene not every trait follows these rules exactly. There are many exceptions to these rules. Mendel probably didn't know much about the exceptions to the rules. But even though we've learned, you know, in the last 120 years about these exceptions to Mendel's rules, that doesn't mean that the rules are not important because these rules form the foundation of modern genetics. And so that's what I want to talk about is what exactly did Mendel say in his 1865 paper that nobody understood? Well, there were four main conclusions. The first two are called rules of heredity. The first one is called the rule of unit factors. Mendel did not ever use the word gene, even though he's the father of genetics. Gene is a modern 20th century word. Um, Mendel used the term factors, or whatever the Austrian word is for factors. He never used the word gene. But the rule of unit factors says for each trait, flower color, seed color, seed shape, for us it might be eye color, skin color, whatever. For each trait, an organism a human, a rabbit, a pea plant, always inherits two genes. Why two? Because you have a mom and a dad. 
So you don't just have one gene for eye color. You have two. Your dad gave you one. Your mom gave you one. If you're a pea plant, you don't just have one gene that determines what color your flowers are. You have two. One from the male parent, one from the female parent. Rule of unit factors. Common sense, but remember, nobody knew this. Nobody even knew that genes behave like individual particles. Remember, people thought somehow the hereditary information blended together like paint, like two different colors of paint. So they really didn't understand that genes are hereditary particles. We know that they're strands of DNA, you know, carried on chromosomes. Mendel, Mendel never knew that. He didn't know about DNA, but, but he knew that genes were discrete particles passed down from the parents, and therefore, because you have two parents, you're always going to have two genes for every trait. Mendel also discovered the idea of dominant and recessive alleles. Uh, we've already touched on this. It's called the rule of dominance. It says, if the two inherited genes, the one you got from your dad, the one you got from your mom, if they happen to be different alleles, like big P, little p, Okay. Only one of those alleles will be expressed. So if a pea plant inherits a purple allele from one parent and a white allele from the other parent, it will not have, <clears throat> excuse me, it will not have white flowers. It will only have purple flowers. And they will not be a blending of purple and white. They will not be whitish purple. They will not be light purple. They will just be purple. Uh, because purple is the dominant trait. So if the two genes are different alleles, only the dominant allele will be expressed. That's why a heterozygous big P, little p plant always has purple flowers. Now, can it still pass down the white allele to its offspring? Yes. But this plant will have purple flowers. All right, the last two conclusions of Mendel are a little more broad in their scope. And so we don't just call them rules, we call them laws. The law of segregation of alleles. Segregate means to separate. So this is something about genes separating. It says when gametes are made, sperm and egg, when they're made, only one of the two genes, only one of the two genes for each trait is passed down to a sperm cell or an egg cell. So you might have, well, you not. there's no might about it. You do have two genes for eye color, one that you got from your dad, one that you got from your mom. But when you make sperm cells or egg cells, you can only pass one of those genes down at a time. You cannot pass them both down. Even though you have two genes, you're only going to pass down one of those two genes to any individual gamete. And it's completely random. It's a 50-50 chance. Now, Mendel did not have any way of knowing why this occurred. Today, we can link this to what we know about meiosis. Today, we know that this law is true because homologous pairs of chromosomes separate. When do they separate? When do the homologous pairs separate? and go to separate cells. Remember the prom night breakup? It's anaphase one. Okay, we can link this to what we know about meiosis. So here's an example. Let's say we have a heterozygous purple flowered pea plant. It has an allele for purple. It has an allele for white. Either one of those can be passed down to a sperm or an egg, but any individual sperm or any individual egg can only get one or the other. Because of separation of chromosomes, because of what happens in anaphase one, both of these alleles, big P and little p, cannot go to the same sperm. At least they're not supposed to. Now there is the, that thing called non-disjunction, where sometimes you know, a homologous pair fails to separate. So that's kind of a weird anomaly. But, but if everything works properly, 
only one of the two genes for a trait can get passed down to any individual gamete. This is called the law of segregation of alleles. The second law is the law of independent assortment. This is based on Mendel's dye hybrid cross uh, experiment, just like the one we just talked about with the uh, yellow round and the green wrinkled uh, seeds. The law says when gametes are made, the genes for different traits like seed color and seed shape or maybe flower color and plant height, you know, whatever. The genes for different traits are passed down to the sperm and egg cells <clears throat> independently. They are not passed down together. So here's an example. Here's a pea plant that's heterozygous purple and heterozygous tall. The uh, allele for tall is a dominant allele. The allele for short plant is recessive. So this is a purple flowered tall pea plant that happens to be heterozygous for both of those traits. So when this pea plant makes gametes, okay, there's four different kinds of gametes that it can make. And we can use FOIL method here. We can take the first P and the first T, and that would be one possibility to pass down the purple and the tall allele. But it's also equally likely that the purple allele will be passed down to the same sperm as the short allele. So you could end up with uh, offspring that have purple flowers and tall height, but you could also have some offspring that have purple flowers and, and short height. Um, little P, big T could end up in the same sperm or little p, little t. Um, so law of independent assortment says which one of the two p's ends up in a gamete has nothing to do with which one of the two t's ends up in a gamete. Okay, so I'm already over a half hour. This is a good place to stop. Um, so I'll stop, and I hope you have a great day.